Good evening, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to the University of Hertfordshire for what I believe is going to be an extremely interesting talk, a talk to be given by our new Police and Crime Commissioner, uh, David Lloyd. Now, David, um, or let me perhaps take a step back uh, and just indicate what the Police and uh, Crime Commissioner is. It's a new role which was introduced by the government to bring direct and democratic accountability to local policing. Uh, our first uh, police and crime commissioner is David Lloyd, and David studied French at Birmingham University. He then worked in uh, banking with Lloyd's and then subsequently as an independent financial advisor before being elected a member of Hertfordshire County Council. He was elected in 1999 uh, and was latterly in the council uh, the chairman of the police authority and the deputy leader of the council. He was elected police commissioner in November 2012 and he has already suggested some fairly radical changes in uh, order to put the public first and to ensure that offenders pay proportionately for the harm that they cause, as well as bringing in plans to bring greater business sense into policing and into crime. Uh, we're absolutely delighted at the University of Hertfordshire to welcome David Lloyd to deliver what we hope will be the first um, public lecture in partnership with the Police and Crime Commissioner and the University. Uh, he's going to discuss his role as Police and Crime Commissioner and his new plan for the county, which is entitled Everyone's Business. David. <laughs> On a Saturday night this February, Police were called to a North Hertfordshire nightclub. Some young men had tried to force entry to the club after being refused by the door staff. When the police arrived, one of these men tried to run off and officers gave chase, but were hindered by the others. Despite being outnumbered, the officers attempted to restrain the offenders, but they were violently set upon by the group. A local crowd surrounding the incident gave vocal encouragement to the offenders. Order was only restored when another officer arrived and parva spray was deployed, as well as a taser being drawn and sighted on one of the assailants. Several police officers were injured in this incident and one of them required hospital treatment. Quite strikingly for me in this story, a group of drunk young men were actually encouraged by a passing crowd to attack police officers undertaking their lawful duties to protect the safety of others. In this lecture, I hope to give you an insight into how my thoughts on policing are influenced and by whom, and I've taken a fresh look at Robert Peel's nine principles of policing. The particular principle which comes to mind is this. Police at all times should maintain a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. The police being only members of the public who are paid to give full-time attention to duties which are incumbent on every citizen in the interests of community welfare and existence. Many questions are begged by this story of a particular North Hertfordshire nightclub. My first thought was, is this kind of thing normal? My second, how do the police cope with this sort of incident? But perhaps the most important question should be, is this the kind of place we want to live in? If you asked any of those involved, even perhaps when they were less 
intoxicated either by alcohol or the activities on the street, what would they say? And what do I need to do about it as the police and crime commissioner? And it's at that last question that I'd like to start. The police and crime commissioner is not the chief constable. Andy Bliss is the chief constable and he upholds the Queen's peace in this county with distinction. It is Andy's job to run the operation of policing in the county and it's not for the police and crime commissioner to interfere with his operational decision making. Statute dictates that the commissioner provides the strategic lead while the chief constable provides the operational. In my language, he is the chief executive, I am the chairman of the board. But it is the role of the commissioner to seek change. And it's the and crime bit that's important. It's a role within a role. That strategic lead is about setting the policing budget, setting priorities for the constabulary, holding the chief constable to account and galvanising partners to tackle crime and to keep our community safe. But the role within the role, as I perceive it, is to start asking questions, to start the debate, to ask what kind of county we want to live in and to make sure that the people of this county are never made to feel that keeping Hertfordshire safe should just be left to the professionals. I called my police and crime plan everybody's business. The plan talks about how we can all play a part in reducing crime and antisocial behaviour, how we can all make our communities safety. Sorry, can all make our communities safer. It places an onus on the Chief Constable and through him the constabulary to continue to perform excellently on our behalves. But it also calls on other partners, on individuals and on businesses to take responsibility, to feel real responsibility and to act on it. This is the theme of the plan because I want to start a debate and because I believe that the crux of the matter is to make policing and crime everybody's business. I don't propose talking about myself rather than the role and the subject of police and crime, but perhaps it's worthwhile saying a little about the influences that I have been on me and it might help give a sense of how my thoughts are formed on all this. I am a conservative, I always have been so, and those guests who've met me before will probably have heard me describe myself, or rather my politics, as libertarian. A belief in small government, free markets, responsibility and the rights of the individual, freedom to own property. My particular sympathies are with social and economic schools along the lines of Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman. Hayek wrote in The Road to Serfdom that probably nothing has done so much harm to the liberal cause as, and I paraphrase here, the wooden insistence of some liberals on laissez-faire. And that's my kind of libertarianism. I very much believe in markets, but recognise there's a role for government to ensure that there's fairness. It would be odd to be in a governance role without that belief, but there will always be some tension between my pure political beliefs and the reality of my role. Hayek argued for a society organised around a market order in which government or the state intervenes almost exclusively to enforce order such that a market of free individuals can exist and function. But let me stress, these are but my background, the foundations of my thoughts. If I'm serious about the fight against crime being everybody's business, and I am, then I need to be listening to what people think of my ideas and to the ideas that other people are bringing to the table. I have shown in the handling of my emerging plans that I want to listen to people's ideas. I want to see change, good change, not just change for its own sake. I want to be part of a debate within the county with residents and businesses and partner organisations. 
It might well be my role to try and spark the debate or lead in the debate as the elected leader in the county on police and crime issues, and it's definitely my role to finalise policy for change and be accountable for the implementation and success of that policy. To my second question then, is this the kind of place people want to live in? We are fortunate, and to paraphrase that great management thinker, Gary Player, isn't it funny how the harder the criminal justice community works, the more fortunate it gets? Hertfordshire is an extremely low crime part of the UK. We're very lucky to live in such a place. And though a lot of good people in this room are working hard to reduce crime, which is of course possible, it'll never disappear entirely, and therefore there will always be some victims of crime. And when someone is the victim of a crime, they must expect and be given excellent service. We must provide them with great care in dealing with the shock, in seeking reparations, and in bringing about justice. So how do we continue to drive down the chance of crime and reduce the numbers of victims? In speeches about criminal justice, it's common to quote Peel's principles from 1829. It's hard to resist, given my public-focused approach, because when reviewed, it is clear that they are as much about the public as they are about the police. Peel said, Police must secure the willing cooperation of the public in voluntary observance of the law to be able to secure and maintain the respect of the public. The degree of cooperation of the public that can be secured diminishes proportionately to the necessity of the use of physical force. Police at all times should maintain a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. Every line stresses the role that public have in securing the peace and it is the final line that I read that really drives this home. The police are the only members of the public who are paid to give full-time attention to duties which are incumbent on every citizen in the interests of community welfare and existence. So what are the duties which Peel says are incumbent on every citizen, and have we forgotten our role and responsibility to exercise those duty over recent decades? Do we consider the effect of our behaviour on the group and the combined effect of the group back on the individual. We have seen dreadful incidents where members of the public have intervened in situations with tragic consequences. Gary Newlove, a 47-year-old man, was beaten to death when he went to confront a gang of youths who were vandalising his car. It was a chilling case. A family man whose life was taken, leaving a wife and three young daughters. How should we respond to incidents of this type? Is this a justification for us never to intervene in any situation for fear that the same fate may befall us? I would argue no. We often bemoan the health and safety culture that supposedly restricts us from clearing snow for fear of being sued or for endless signs stating the blindingly obvious. Surely we do not want to apply that overly cautious and restrictive health and safety culture to the way that we live our own lives. Couldn't we consider intervening more or just speaking out and challenging bad and criminal behaviour? However, the decline in public intervention leaves our society at risk. Evidence shows that citizens' arrests have declined by half over the past 10 years. This is fuelled by a fear of the consequences, not simply from the criminal's reaction, but a lack of certainty that the police will support these actions. The recent report by one of the think tanks that I follow most closely, Policy Exchange, highlighted that only 15 forces allow crime to be reported online, let alone the provision of intelligence. I'm not saying that everyone should intervene in every instance. 
people should have regard for their own safety and should not put themselves into positions of high risk. But I fear that too many of us have reverted to a default response of not intervening, thinking that it's only the job of the police. Even worse, there's a tendency to turn a blind eye and not even bother to report things to the police. If people give the police information about criminality or the prospect of criminality, it should be listened to and followed up. If and when there is an outcome resulting from such intelligence, it should be fed back to those that provided the information. We can't expect people to put information into a black hole, not ever knowing whether it's acted upon or whether the concern has gone because the forces of law have acted. Not everyone will be able to interview, intervene, but almost every one of us could do more to place ourselves clearly on the side of the law abiding and against the malignant impact of criminality. And of course, many do. We have many special constables working across the county, giving up their time to fight crime as normal police officers. Neighbourhood Watch is booming in the county. Many other volunteers volunteer to run football teams, youth groups, visit old people. This is not a council of despair, but it is a call for a shift from the passive to the active in tackling crime and starving the oxygen that allows crime to continue. So what more can be done? The line between right and wrong is usually fairly clear, and we need to consider that line in our regular daily lives. Buying cigarettes and alcohol from unlicensed sources is an example. Whilst the thrill of avoiding the taxation may be undeniable, even if we recognise it's used to pay for policing, hospitals and other essential services, all too often the source of these goods links to wider criminal networks. Often these will be smuggled goods to avoid tax or stolen goods needing to be fenced. By reflecting on our involvement in this chain, there is a chance to stop it by not purchasing these goods, and even better, by reporting the offer of sale to the police or trading standards. The associated criminality is also put at risk. I believe, and this is quite a simple one, that parents should know what their children are doing in the evening. It's a parent's responsibility to ask and sometimes to challenge their offspring. We should be taking an interest to ensure that our children are not engaging in online and offline bullying, making the lives of others a misery. As a linguist by training, I know as well as anybody how much more receptive children are to acquiring native fluency in languages at that age rather than university students in their late teens and early 20s. Behaviour, like language, gets learnt and entrenched in young minds. That's why I think we should work harder than ever to identify those cases where criminality and antisocial behaviour can seem to run in the family and seek to prevent the normalisation of that way of being in their children. We should work with councils and schools and the families themselves to play a bigger and bigger part in helping people to make better choices. And the normalisation of criminal behaviour is actually everywhere. Illegal drugs, so I'm told, are no less present on university campus than they were in my days in the 1980s. If you're a student, remind your friends about the route taken for the supply of illegal drugs. Often the same criminals will be involved with people trafficking and child exploitation. You may not feel like a victim if you buy illegal drugs, but almost certainly there have been victims along the journey to you. Many of the same responsibilities fall to businesses as well. It is in businesses' best interest to trade in locations that are affluent and free of crime. However, too often businesses do not recognise their wider corporate social responsibility, or when they do, they find the public services disinterested or even hostile. Businesses have a role to play. Can they operate to ensure that crime is restricted? Target hardening, as it's known in the business. In retail, businesses can ensure that their goods in stores are protected. One officer 
in the Hertfordshire Constabulary tells me that the copper's favourite shop is Argos, where everything is behind a counter and out of reach. However, stores can design themselves to ensure that shoplifting is more difficult, use security guards, and when that fails, ensuring that CCTV is better utilised. And the normal is everywhere. Why do some of our local newspapers, newspapers take small ads for so-called personal services? Family publications that carry advertisements that are clearly a front for prostitution. Whatever one's personal view on the nature of the law on prostitution, it is shown that prostitution is commonly linked with other forms of criminality, including drugs, people trafficking and underage sex. Let's start the debate. However, if the reduction of crime or criminality is the responsibility of the ordinary citizen and the family and the press and our businesses, then we need to see a shift in the gearing between the state and the individual. A shift which I believe can help bring about a fundamental change for the better in our society. The criminal justice system, in my opinion, too often favours the offender and not the victim. The police should always respond quickly to threat, risk and harm, especially when someone has intervened in a difficult situation. There should be a presumption that the rights of the intruder are reduced once they enter someone's property or are committing any criminal act. This is not a call for vigilantism, but just that someone who takes the premeditated step to burgle someone's house or steal someone's car needs to accept that the owner can rightly take steps to protect their property and to protect themselves and their family. So the police interpretation should be on the side of the victim, not the intruder. The wider criminal justice system should also operate this presumption. People's rights to protection are not the same when they break into someone's house or car. Hertfordshire has active and vibrant neighbourhood watch schemes across the county. But some people would readily do more. And some groups are not involved in civic society at all. To date, the state has had mixed views about volunteers. Establishing training and awareness for the public on how to respond to criminal and antisocial incidents in their locality should be prioritised. It's easy to be seduced by the idea of a golden age when scallywags and rascals were reformed by a clip round the ear from the local bobby, vicar or school teacher. However, we need to give people back the validity of stopping bad behaviour. They need to know that they will be supported in their actions, including in the response when the police are called. A greater understanding should be given to those people that take a real stake in their communities. Local authorities need to take sides against those that disrupt the peaceful lives of those around them. Getting housing right is an issue. I'm told that for drug addicts, for example, a lack of housing and worklessness are two of the biggest factors linked to failure to complete treatment programmes. But a home to live in is something to be cherished. Do known criminals or antisocial neighbours in social housing deserve to retain that home at the expense of the happiness or safety of those around them? Is there an alternative which works? Is our approach to housing ex-offenders in the community right? What is the net effect of these policies on wider society, on overall criminality? Is the taxpayer getting value for money, something police probation and housing authorities and providers need to assess and reassess. I've seen and spoken to a lot of victims of crime over the past six months. One case that sticks in my memory is a man who was attacked by a neighbour who lived upstairs in another flat. He has to walk past his assailant on most days, face his sneers and taunts, and remain in fear of a repeat attack. Yet I suspect that this young man would be less likely than his attacker to reach the top of the priority list if he wanted to be rehoused away from harm. 
I'm afraid that there are too many people working in our rehabilitation services that believe that criminality is not a choice, that there is something preordained about it. Don't get me wrong, I believe in rehabilitation. Getting rehabilitation right is a major part of the mix of reducing offending and reoffending. But it must be with a focus and it needs to start from the position that everyone has a choice. I do not accept the inevitability of people being forced into crime. If that were true, crime would be higher and all those that didn't enjoy their fair share of life's chances and opportunities would be criminals, and they're not. Everyone makes their own choices. The final part of my lecture may offer some reassurance. Back to the nightclub. Is this normal? Cheering on an attack on police officers by violent drunks outside a nightclub is not normal. Police and indeed all blue light services command high public respect in Hertfordshire. To give you some numbers to back this up, there are 1,850 police officers in Hertfordshire. With a million residents, that means less than one officer to every 500 people. Clearly then, the main thing that keeps us safe and relatively crime-free is that the vast majority of the population choose not to commit crime. Public services are highly developed. Eco economics, sociology, social psychology, criminology are all well-developed sciences. The tactics, equipment, skills and techniques of policing are continuously improving, continuously adapting to meet new challenges and a look under the bonnet will tell you that they, really they are pretty finely tuned. People like the Chief Constable have a lot of knowledge and a lot of skill. In my role as the Police and Crime Commissioner, I have to keep an eye on this. I have to ensure on the public's behalf that there is continuous improvement, that the public's money is spent wisely, that there is common cause between our partners in the fight against crime, that crime rates are kept in check and that the experience of victims is paramount. In my role within a role, it's my job if aspects of criminality have become normal, the contraband cigarettes, drug taking or small ads that I raised before, to point that out. It's my role to begin a debate with the people of Hertfordshire, to ask if that's the kind of county we want to live in, to draw together the services and partners who can make a difference, to encourage the people of this county to make it their business to help change things for the better.